This is episode 221 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Control and Compound Financial. They teach real estate investors how to multiply their wealth using infinite banking strategies. For a complimentary wealth coaching session or to learn more, visit www.controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have Diana Lizarazzo on the show. Diana and I have known each other online for a couple of years. I've done a live stream on her Instagram platform uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, we sort of kept in touch. She's up to some interesting things, including creating a platform, sort of a social media platform for real estate investors, which I just thought was, wow, that's that's a big task and a big undertaking. Uh, wasn't really the focus of today's episode, though. Uh, what we focused on today was really setting yourself up for success in real estate investing. So we talked a lot about the concept of leverage and debt and how to use that in your business, um, you know, how there is a fine line of overuse and underuse. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, there were people that, that did overuse it and it, uh, it bit them. And uh, we talked a lot about what's happening in the market, what's happening in society here in Canada and uh, how we're adapting, um, how I look at things, how Diana looks at things. I uh, thought it was a really interesting uh, conversation. Diana is a flipper most recently. So she's a flipper and private lender. She does flipping. Her husband has a renovation business. They sort of uh, do that stuff together. And um, also he has his business um, helping other clients too. And then she talked briefly about uh, her private lending business in this conversation today too. Uh, Diana is one of those ones that came from the mentality that uh, you don't borrow debt you you know you pay off your debt as quickly as possible and uh, it was one of the interesting stories of how people sort of rewrite that to play this real estate game rightly or wrongly uh, i used to be very very pro you know leverage it up um, but I've, I've certainly become more conservative in recent years uh, in that regard um, i think that it, it does need to be done intelligently uh, when you take on debt you need to do it in a way that that you're comfortable with all possible outcomes and uh, that's easier said than done, of course. So I uh, hope you enjoyed today's discussion. As always, I wanna ask you to please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're an audio listener, a five-star rating and review will be greatly helpful to getting this podcast out to more people. So if you're enjoying this content, please let me know by doing that. And uh, hey, why not share this with somebody that you think it could help? And just before we jump in, I want to also remind you that my sister channel, REI Hot Seat on YouTube, is where you can go to hear deals broken down weekly, and you can hear my thoughts on the market and recent news, things that have come up. So that's a, a very current weekly uh, posting show on YouTube, REI Hot Seat. So the link to that is in the description for this episode. And without further ado, let's jump into episode 221 with Diana Lizarazzo. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Podcast. I've got Diana Lizarazzo on the show. Been practicing that. So Diana, thanks for coming. We have talked for a couple of years now, just here mm -hmm. and there. And I know you're up to stuff. You do a bunch of content, and uh, you also do a lot of investing. So we're going to talk about all of it. But could you give me the Coles notes and give our audience the Coles notes of sort of how you came to be an investor? And uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be on. And so for me, it was really my parents actually did invest. They did the buy and hold strategy. Well, they did. Yeah. And so they did do it. So I did have that experience, but I did still have the mentality of like, that is bad. That's like one thing that took me a long time to get over. Mm -hmm. And um, but I loved the fact that they had tenants that was because it was just like, oh, my God, tenants mm -hmm. pay rent and that rent can go towards the mortgage. Yeah. And because I had this bad view on debt, it just made me feel so much better that I was like, well, at least the tenants yeah. are paying for it. You know, that was like my thought process. <laughs> yeah. The theory, the theory of good debt versus bad debt. Yeah. That's something I actually used to teach. I, I taught an intro business course at Western. And that was something I used to teach, like matching. Like if you have a long-term use, like like a house, it's okay to have long-term debt, but you don't want to be buying a house on a credit card or dinner with a mortgage. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Or like that. For me, it just became: Do you care about the debt mm -hmm. if you're making money? Yeah, you know, not like if, as if you're much. making, let's yeah. say two, like a thousand, two thousand, and your debt is, a, let's say you're making two thousand and your debt is a thousand. Does mm -hmm. it really matter? You know, no, it's you're like winning, you're sure. winning, your investors winning. Yeah. yeah, there's there's ways to make it sort of 
work. Yeah, exactly. for sure. And that's, you know, I mean, most of the people listening to this show probably have some level of uh, being okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, although I know there's some people out there, but I mean, they, they must have had some advantages that like they just won't, they won't do debt. They'll do, they'll, they'll only be an equity partner because they won't do debt. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but I, that's at least what got me into yeah. being more comfortable with it and not because literally I count the first property I bought, I calculated how much interest I would would pay in yeah. 25 years. And being an engineer that traumatized me because the amount of yeah. money, it was literally double the price. So I could, oh, yeah, I could buy totally. two houses Plus, by the end of that 25 yeah. years. I could buy two house, like I could have bought yeah. two houses or sorry, like an extra house. Like I would have had two yeah. with that, pre with the interest it would have gave me another one. So yeah. that just kind of sent me into loop, which is like, naturally i'm an engineer mm. so i'm very numbers oriented oh, yeah. very analysis paralysis also type of person was that what happened a lot at the beginning for me to get even into real estate as in not the buy and hold because i had my dad so that was easy so you were doing buy and holds already so i started to do buy and holds and okay. because he did it he was my go-to which i feel like is the same if and you go you for were cash mentors. flow focused obviously um no i wasn't i had the gta mentality Really? Yeah. With the dad that was a, a, a landlord. Yeah, but, but he, he was, was getting cash from his. Yeah, he was. But his was also GTA mentality, though, too. It was the mentality yeah. you invest in a property within five years, you should start getting cash flow. OK, so it didn't right? have to be from. Day so it was one. about yeah. appreciation. Right. So yeah. in the beginning, I was the full GTA mentality of like things are about appreciation. You know, don't worry. But like I, that that was my extent of knowledge in it. But then you start learning about other people doing it or not even people, but just like you hear about firms or people making money. I'm like, I want to like make money quicker. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, you get into the rich dad, poor dad. That's yeah. the one that really flipped things around for me. And then I really started investigating mm -hmm. what I can do and how to get things done. And for example, like my husband, he has a renovation business. So I was like, dude, we need to take advantage of your skills and do See. something. So all these things then I started coming yeah. together where it was just like, we need to figure out how to do this and actually run it as a business. That's basically then what became my goals. I want to yeah. run real estate as a business. And that is so, so critical. And I don't, I mean, the first time I went into real estate investing, I did not run it as a business. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, came out of business school and I just couldn't figure out how to apply the theory I'd learned, even though I went to a case-based school, couldn't figure out how to apply theory to real life. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while. It took a few bumps and bruises before things started to click. Mm -hmm you have to run every single rental property as its own business. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then things start going smoother. Like no business do you ever not have working capital, right? That's your money in your account. Mm -hmm. You never just have enough to cover a mortgage payment. You gotta have, you gotta cover the what ifs. That's what a business owner does. Exactly. Yeah. But it's funny because they don't teach us that yeah. about real estate, right? Like that the GT mentality is about appreciation, right? They don't, we were not taught mm -hmm. like, try to run your real estate as a business. Like mm. it's not so common, right? To think of it in that sense. But is anyone really teaching people to to invest at all, right? In real estate, exactly. right? I mean, yeah. invest in your your Canada pension, of course, force by force. Uh, and then you have, <laughs> uh, you have, you know, you can throw RSPs and what have you. That's all people are really taught, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so then when we get into it, yeah. not knowing, you don't even, like you said, right? You don't even really think of it in a business sense, you know, like, yeah. or how can I apply it? Or you don't even know because there isn't enough you know, yeah, you don't know what you people. don't know. Yeah, you exactly. don't know. Exactly. Until know. you start getting into the communities or yeah. finding people that have done it. And then you're like, oh, so this does yeah. exist. You know, this is a new world. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I could say, like, wow, if, if the communities that exist now existed when I started or when I was about to start, man, would I be further along? Mm -hmm. However, if they existed back then, it probably would have been a lot more competitive, a lot harder. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's just uh, for anyone starting like to have the access to information they have now is awesome. Mm -hmm. The downside is, of course, it's way more expensive now. It's it's yeah. more challenging now. You got to you got to be a little more flexible about where you're investing. And mm -hmm. but uh, I think there's still such an incredible opportunity, right? hundred percent. Yeah. And I think I think now it's more about, I think, a lot more leaning towards creativity because things are getting harder yeah. you can always make rules are being like created now mm -hmm. with the governments like so many things are changing and i think that's where the entrepreneur mentality comes from too right it's like okay i'm giving these rules i'm giving these parameters now how can i go around it without you know doing something yeah. like illegal or you know breaking the law or whatever you know it's like it's kind of like a fun way of like okay now you've given me this challenge mm -hmm. 
what can I do now? You know? <laughs> and there's, a, well, there's enough people out there. Like for instance, the, uh, the new landlord restrictions that are coming out in Ontario. I don't know if that's actually been codified yet or, you know, where it's at, but I, I know they had a, a page for it and they were going to get, you know, stop the rent evictions. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. Um, in a province that really needs more, um, it needs to be more landlord friendly. It's getting more tenant friendly, but mm -hmm. If you hang out with other real estate investors, you know how to interpret that that new legislation. You know ways around it, as you're pointing out. Um, I I did a, an REI hot seat episode on this last week where I talked about you know reading through it and what I interpret from that and how that's actually going to affect things. If you get past the headlines, it's not as scary as it might seem. But that's mm -hmm. you know getting past the headlines, strategizing with fellow real estate investors. Hey, how are you going to manage this? What do you you know? Are you adjusting your approach? Mm -hmm. um, and even and maybe changing where you look. Yeah. Because, you know, I've started noticing a lot, for example, a lot of people will really listen to the politicians speaking mm -hmm. and they are salespeople. They're trying to sell. They're trying to pitch their ideas. Mm -hmm. But if you go to like the... I don't know what you call it here. Is it House of Commons we call it? But if you go to wherever they're yeah. talking about the actual ideas and how they're pitched, it's actually yeah. quite different. It's not so dramatic. I feel like the news yeah. makes it quite traumatizing. So you're saying you think? actually listen to the the actual talks on yeah. on the Ontario TV or on the Canadian House of Commons TV, yeah. whatever that one is. Yeah. So. It's yeah. because you know what? It's less yeah. dramatic to be honest how do you do that though no one ever answers anyone's questions it's just you know this <laughs> one side stands up and says you know answer for this and then the other side stands up and doesn't answer and just you know it just so, goes back yeah, and forth so yeah <laughs> so so I like to listen to yeah. the ones that are when they're they've basically made the final verdict when they tell you like what the resolution is. That's oh, okay. what I like listening to. Okay. Where it's like so let's after say the, they passed a bill. Yeah. Or when, yeah. yeah. So sorry, I don't know. I'm very yeah. bad with like the terms, but that's where I like to listen to that. Like what yeah. actually has come to pass and and like how it works or what their plans are, the regulations or whatever. I like listening mm. to that because you'll hear, for example. Like that, they, they'll say like, oh, the flippers tax. Oh, you know, the rent evictions. But then when you start reading into it. Yeah, it's not um, so simple. There's nuance. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you're just like, okay, here's here are the rules. Here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I transition to it? And to be honest, though, mm -hmm. when let's say when anything is ever done, everything is always going to be affecting the seller mm -hmm. or the buyer, right? To be honest, we're the middlemen. As in, like, let's say in the flipping like if we're sense, a flipper, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking in the, yeah. in the flipping sense. Like, let's say we're a flipper. Like, we need to run, or even either side. Even if you're, like, even if you're buying, right? We're thinking in a business sense is what I'm getting at. So we need to make sure we're meeting our margins and whatever we need to do. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna run things in that way according to the laws that we have to mm -hmm. meet, right? So it's very. So for us, we're thinking in a business sense. But what really affects it is the other people, right? Like the tenants get affected, the people, yeah. let's say, who are selling it or, you know, or like if it's flippers, the people who are buying it, right? Because we are running a business. We need to make sure we're making our margins because or else yeah. our business is not going to run, right? And that yeah. becomes to me a problem. Well, the whole, the whole uh, eliminate or they're just taxing like this, this whole new tax on fl the flippers tax. It was already implied anyway. <laughs> like if you had a, a, an accountant that was doing their job, um, they would have told you, well, if, if you're running flipping as a business, we can't report this as like a rental and then just sell it the next year. You're going to get caught. You're going to get taxed down the road. Mm -hmm. Just call it active. Uh, I have, I eventually formed a flipping business, had that discussion with my accountant, ran it. I, mm -hmm. I incorporated, paid the 12 and a half percent income tax on, on the active income. It Which was, is a lot less that you play in your personal yeah, anyways. Yeah. So to me, for example, that, that was thing. a selling pitch. Yeah. I don't know if it actually ended up going through or anything like the extra whatever's. But yeah. that flip, for example, for flippers, I was just kind of like, well, it's only affecting people in the personal. And yeah. I'm like, I'm a flipper. Well, yeah, if one you of already them, run so a I'm business for that, it doesn't matter. And if you're it's already not... declaring it as exactly. it, the only people that would have affected are the, the people who are just trying to squeak one through here and there, like exactly. the ones that weren't that serious. But if you're hanging yeah. out with serious people, you were going it's to graduate yeah. to to the uh, more formalized way of doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so I believe anyway. Yeah. And that and that, like that, like I feel like that group of people is much smaller than the actual flippers, right? Like the ones that do the one-offs. It again, they're just yeah. doing it as a one-off, right? Yeah. And whereas if you're running it as a business, you know, like you want to get taxed 
50% of that uh, your income or you want to get taxed much less, you know, in a yeah, corporation especially, like Especially logically. if you want to roll the money in, right? Like maybe yeah. maybe you have your job still or you have other sources of income and you don't want to spend that money. This isn't tax advice. This is just how I look at it. Mm -hmm. um, then maybe you just leave the money in there, reinvest it, flip another mm -hmm. one. Like that's yeah. that's how I looked at it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the government isn't going to fight you over wanting to call it active. Although in corporations, passive is way more expensive. Yes. Uh, there are like ways around or it. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> not an accountant here, but this is just me telling you what my accountant said. Uh, if you pay yourself a dividend, mm -hmm. uh, or if I paid myself a dividend, my accountant told me that that I would get some of it back. Mm -hmm. So far, I've been able to just use capital cost allowance and write things off and mm -hmm. keep the income like break even, mm -hmm. so that no tax needed to be paid. But yeah. uh, you know, obviously, eventually people kind of hit that profitability point, and uh, you deal with that then. So exactly. Um, but I, 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 to summarize this discussion is is really like getting away from headlines, surrounding yourself with smart people, uh, getting educated by working, you know, dealing with people and talking to people who are just mm -hmm. crushing it, doing well, like yeah. doing doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the greatest things about this podcast is I get to talk to so many people who are doing things mm -hmm. and they become my network. That's my sphere of, of people, my friends. And I, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. um, the community I see around and you're 100%. doing that too. You're creating community. Yeah. Um, and especially I think right now, even mm -hmm. more is the best time to be networking yeah. because of like what's happening in the markets, the economy and everything's like changing and shifting so much that I literally I feel like I talk to mortgage brokers is like mortgage brokers and real estate investors are the people I talk to a lot these days because mortgages are changing all the time. The appraisals are changing all the time. Investors, so, so many different investors are doing so many different strategies mm -hmm. and things are changing for them. Like one person that may have just finished the burr, let's say last month, another person's getting affected in a different way. Mm -hmm. I noticed that specifically, I mean, not maybe one month difference, but like, let's say in September, the way things are happening for, let's say, people doing burrs mm -hmm. and getting refinances change, changed and, mm -hmm. and it's different now. So it's just like, this time, I feel like this is a time where it's like you have to be talking you to need as a many support group. people. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very important right now. It's like you need to because it's yeah. just like things are changing so quickly. And like banks are confused. You know, we're, everyone's confused and you can see it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to give any names, but I know a guy who uh, I know a few people who've, who've gotten spanked, so to speak, on a few things in the downturn. But I know a guy who had three flips and lost on all of them. Mm, uh, yeah. Big ones. But that's it. Yeah. But that in itself. You need a support group for that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's to me, depending on yeah. when it happened. Because, for example, yeah. like, let's say what's happening right now. Um, because let me tell you, for example, like last year I did a flip when it's, things were going down and we did very well You're on okay, the flip. Yeah. And to re the reason I think that why we did well on the flip is because, like, I don't know why people were ignoring the interest rate hikes. Mm -hmm. Like, they for some reason were like, I don't know, closing their eyes to it and being like, yeah, it's not going to impact anything. It's OK. Let's keep on buying, buying, buying. Yeah. I fully expected things to be like impacted. Yeah. And so I did my analysis to that. And and in the area that we invested in, not only I was expecting it to flatline. So I was expecting from the year before I expected like it's going to probably be the same. Which area is this? in Hamilton, the downtown okay. core of Hamilton. I expected it to be so, the same. So back in, what was the first hike? March 2022? That yeah, was so we bought in, it was in uh, no, that the year before. Okay. So just before all those things were happening. But I, again, mm. like they so were things were on their way up aggressively. It. Yeah. Yeah. But they were also talking about it, right? That they were, yeah. it was happening, it was happening. And I believed it, you know? And because, yeah. for example, they tell us now interest rates are going flat. Yeah, I believe it. They want to wait to see if the market will drop enough. And then yeah. once if it does or doesn't in the next couple quarters, it'll probably they'll decide, OK, are we going to stay flat again? Or are we going to go up or down or what? Right. It's just like they, they they tell you what they're going to do. And but there were people that were listening to that Tiff Macklem guy when he said that they wouldn't raise interest rates till the end of 2023 at earliest when they were giving away all that free money at the at the beginning of the lockdowns. Um, that's so the sometimes beginning. it's tough. That's the beginning. Sometimes no, it's talking. tough to believe yeah, yeah. what they say from one day to the next. It is yeah. true. That's yeah. true. That's true too. But because that was at the beginning of COVID, you're talking about when they yeah, started yeah. talking about. Yeah. No, I meant 
when they started talking about now when they started talking the about rates, the raises See, i was just like I, think, I believe them because of what was going on with the economy yeah, like it was yeah. going insane that i'm like i believe you i'm like this is crazy we need to bring like stabilize or something <laughs> I, i'm at a stage where i just don't believe anything anyone in government says ever <laughs> That's uh, true. but uh yeah i get it i get it and, and there were signs there of course and i think uh, for me i was sort of in this sort of skeptical uh, area where i didn't think that they had the you know how do I put this? I didn't think they were willing to do what it would take to actually control it, which I still mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. um, because they still haven't controlled the inflation. Um, and now they're going to be kind of put into a uh, position where, I mean, Canadians are headed, a lot of Canadians are headed for some hard times because of the added costs, right? Yes. High debt load, added costs. A lot of them are, you know, in, in houses that are maybe worth what they paid or less. Mm -hmm. um, so that's short term. That doesn't necessarily need to be long term. But mm -hmm. I didn't really believe that they would do the hikes so aggressively like they sort of needed to. Mm -hmm. um, and I was surprised by that mm -hmm. because this is the same government that was, you know, oh, you're locked down. Don't worry. We'll just give you some free money to stimulate the economy, even though you can't go out and spend it. Mm -hmm. um, it was just illogical to me. So that's mm -hmm. why I, I have a healthy skepticism, I'll say, of what they say. <laughs> but that being said, you should always position yourself to be prepared for those things, right? 100%. Which is why we build in cash flow to our deals, because mm -hmm. we never know. I, I like to just approach it with the I never know. And I'm never going to speculate the values are going to keep going up yes. because I don't know that. Exactly. Um, so 100%. if I'm going to flip a property, it needs to work at today's value. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for there to be a buffer in there that it will work even less than today's value. Completely um, agree. And it's just a matter of how aggressive do you want to be. Not everyone can run their business that way. Some people say, well, I'll flip enough. And if I lose on one or two because I'm being a little aggressive, I'll make it up on the others. Maybe mm -hmm. that works until you have an incident like last year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it might hurt. But for, for a lot of people and, you know, Matt Pichet, for instance, that guy was flipping like a machine, mm -hmm. uh, took a pause from it. Um, he did have, he mentioned to me he had a loss. I don't think he'd mind. Uh, one of his properties did lose, mm -hmm. uh, but now he's back at it, you mm -hmm. know, like, so it's all how you've built your, how you've built your business, how much you use it and run it like it's a business. Exactly. That's and, the important and, part. And those Running are the two big like things, a business. I think. Yeah. yeah. Cause as a business like that, I mean, for us as investors, we have to be watching the news all the time. Yeah. To me, I felt like what was the problem with a lot of investors is they weren't watching the news. Sure. Um, and they weren't seeing like what was going on. And at least so, I mean, kind they had of the rose colored stuff. glasses, just expecting yeah. things to go on, expecting prices to keep climbing forever. Yeah, because, yeah. for example, in that big um, hike that happened just before everything started dropping, mm -hmm. like I would run numbers and they didn't make sense. Yeah. And so and I was seeing all these people investing and I'm like, what numbers are you using? Because yeah. it's not working. <laughs> yeah. I mean, welcome to my world. That's how I felt for the last five years, six years. Uh, <laughs> that's why I just cooled it for so long. I'm like, that. this isn't attractive to me. Mm -hmm. Like numbers in Chatham and stuff were attractive, but I didn't want to go that far. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, I you know, should have. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, people people do need to be paying attention and, and not expecting, not speculating that things will just continue and be rosy forever. Yes, that was that was I felt like the hardest for me was, you know, people would always be speculating or you go to make offers and they think your offers are crazy because mm -hmm. mine would be with non speculative numbers, mm -hmm. which would look weird in the economy that we were in before. Right. Things were just yeah. going up, up, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was just like, but I just don't feel comfortable like speculating. So I'm like, what do you want me to speculate? 5% increase, 10% increase, 20. Yeah. Like people were expecting like these kind of 10 to 20% mm -hmm. increases. And I was like, I'm like, I'm just like what you're saying. I'm making sure that what it is now, I can at least sell it for that amount. And yeah. like you said, if maybe it goes, you break even, if it yeah. if if it uh, you know it goes down a little, you know, mm -hmm. like or if it stays the same, you make a small profit. Like yeah. that's okay. Um, I, I've always built 2% into my spreadsheets because mm -hmm. like that's like inflation historically. Mm -hmm. I mean, the inflation they admit to. Yeah. Um, so I felt like that's like very reasonable to assume. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, you know, Toronto on a 25 year, I think it's like over five, it's like 7% or yeah. something a year. And it changes per property yeah. type too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have to get so, more micro about how you yeah. look at it. Okay. So Diana, what, like, I know we talked about sort of what, what motivated you to invest. You So you said your dad was buying properties. Did he have a lot or just a, one or two? Just a, a few. Yeah, okay. Just a couple. So you had a few properties and in Toronto, that kind of gave you an idea that it works. It's something you can use to build wealth. And then how long ago did you buy your first? How long ago? My very first? I think it's like 10 years ago when I bought my first ago? property. Yeah. And 
have you been actively buying throughout like what, what tell me like what you sort of set out to do and what you've acquired you know maybe maybe things changed along the way yeah so i started with the buy and hold and then you know the whole wait for appreciation wait for the next one so then i did the next one was that i saved up as much money as i could i i mean i also made some mistakes in even in that because um, I don't know if it's miscommunication, but I was told that the money I put into the house mm -hmm. that I currently had, that I would be able to pull that out for the next one or all of it, they said. Mm -hmm. And so Is the bank said that the bank said okay. it. Yeah. So then I was and my trauma of I don't even it's not even trauma. I don't know why, because it's not nothing ever happened bad. But my being scared about debt. My initial yeah. was like paid off, paid off, paid off. Like my plan was actually yeah. to pay off that house within five to ten years. Okay. Like I was aggressively <laughs> dumping in money because I was so Most people have traumatic. that mentality. Though, oh yeah, I think. don't you think? Like I think I'm not sure. I think I mean I had a bit of that wired into me. Like you know I think a lot of uh, people you know were raised Christian or Muslim. Like you know it's taught that you know your debt's not a good thing yeah so you <laughs> uh, just yeah aggressively get into it yeah you want to get yeah. it paid off and then you get into the real estate investing world and it's like leverage 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 mm -hmm. but there's there's a, a delicate line yeah fine balance yeah that's for sure <laughs> yeah so then yeah so then i was paying off a lot of a lot of the house by the three-year mark um i had probably paid a, already a third of it off wow and then uh, and then so and then I went to go buy the next one, but I thought I could pull out a lot more than they were telling me. And and it was fine. Like I was able to pull out what I needed, but I just expected, you know, I just got information like if I knew the right information, I probably would have done it differently. Like I mm. probably wouldn't have dumped. I probably would have, to be honest, actually saved the money on the side instead because my plan yeah. was to accumulate oh, houses. Oh, you were to pull it back out. Yeah. yeah. And you were probably doing it for efficiency because you didn't want to pay interest. Exactly. If you pay it down faster. Yeah. And I've been like that. I used to be like that. Every dollar, pay it off, pay it off. Yeah. And I look back and I'm like, man, I wish I did things differently. Like when I got out of, out of school, I started working right away. Mm -hmm. And I was putting down a thousand to fifteen hundred a month on my student debt mm -hmm. instead of the minimum, which would have been like four hundred or whatever. I could have just saved up that five percent, bought a house with mm -hmm. the roommates I was already living with, and house hacked. Yeah, I could have rented them rooms and, and been rent free. And I look at that now, and I'm like, that's so obvious <laughs> and no brainer. Back then, I didn't know. Isn't I it wish really I knew. funny to look back? Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. So in the year that I finished university, I managed to pay off my. I got a new car, so I paid mm -hmm. off in a year, mm -hmm. and I paid off my 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 student loans mm -hmm. in a year. Like I was like that. Like debt. Yeah, you just saved was every just dime. Like, yeah. Debt for me was I don't know like a yeah. thing that I was just like I mm -hmm. never like it was like the most I, mm -hmm. like wrong thing that you can have or something. To the point yeah. that, can you imagine those little debts, how traumatizing they were to me, that buying a house was like mm. hot flashes, yeah. having trauma, and I'm just like, how am I yeah. going to do this? You know, like I would have preferred to just have the cash in the hole and just pay the house cash. Yeah. You know, that's how much like debt was just so traumatizing to me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I get that. And I think that's very common. Is, mm. is uh, and Not everybody. I mean, obviously, some people don't care at all. Mm. But uh, I've known a lot of people that have that mentality. And and there are people that, that manage their finances very well mm -hmm. um, because they just don't want it. But with that said, it is it is an opportunity they're passing up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say it's you know right or wrong. But if you want to you want to get wealth and and go fast in real estate, um, you're going to use some level of, of leverage. Oh, yeah. yeah you're like not going to go in and buy every property cash. You're going to run no. out of money real fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like that, like what you're saying, right? It's that fine line of understanding yeah. that are the profits good enough? Or for mm. example, even like you said, let's say, you know, you have, let's say your three, six month kind of like lump sum amount of money in there to hold mm. you over it if mm. something happens. Yeah. Like having contingencies is really what it yeah. turned into, you know, like making sure you're making smart decisions on yeah. how to buy that property and making sure, let's say if it's a, if it's um like a buy and hold or like a burr or something, mm. like is there going to be yeah. cash flow? Like, and then like that, like, do you have like your little months of money that you need to yeah. just maintain it? And then it makes you feel better like that. Like now I, yeah. I really enjoy debt. Like debt to me is actually a lot of <laughs> That's fun. That's a big shift. I enjoy it's, it. It's a huge, it is. It's Love so much stuff. fun. It's, yeah. it's like for me, it's like, how can I be creative with debt now? And how can I leverage it and use mm -hmm. it the best, like the smartest way I can? Like it's now about like a create, being creative about it and finding that, like you said, like that balance of, 
mm-hmm. being able to use or like finding, for example, you know, like when you get like the balance transfer deals, you know, for like sure. the one yeah, percent for like I a year. Those. those like excite me. So like I pull it out and I'm just like, mm-hmm. man, one percent or, or yeah, I mean, the fees like one percent. So yeah, I was like yeah. and then trying to strategize work out like the how to yeah. put it through and make sure you get it back. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, one of those way too numbers are into. Oh, yeah, me I'm a recovering. <laughs> I'm a recovering spreadsheet nerd. Like, I just I just find lately I don't really have much time for that kind of thing. But um, but yeah, like I used to do stuff like that, too. I think eventually when I started running things, you know, bigger uh, and I have all these different companies and I've got credit cards with every different company and access cards, like I have multiple wallets that are like exploding with cards. Yes. And I'm just like, okay, I don't have time or space in my head for any of that. Like if I have to make a payment, like actually have to initiate it myself. I'm like, this is no good. I need to need a way to automate this Uh, because I can't have this on my schedule as something to do Mm -hmm. and uh yeah so that's that's why i wouldn't do stuff like that is because now i need to remember but i know some for some people it's just like put a calendar invite or a calendar reminder you'll be fine yeah Uh, for me i don't want (laughs) to no i hear you i i'm actually i feel like i'm starting to get to that point too because for example i don't know if you're seeing it but there's a lot of like pre-approvals now coming in for for like lines of credits and yeah. credit cards. At least I've been getting so many sure, of them. Yeah. And now I'm just like, no, thank you. I'm like, and yeah. to the point, I'm like, can you just increase the ones that I already yeah. have? Because it's just like, I don't need Well, if you're with Scotiabank, take ones. them and then go into the branch and get them to reallocate your credit card to your unsecured line of credit. Like oh. th- that's what I've been doing with Scotiabank every time they give me a, a, a credit limit increase. I just yeah. say, I don't need all that credit limit. Just uh, shovel like a thousand dollars limit onto my, um, my unsecured line. And mm-hmm. I built that unsecured line from like a $10,000 limit. To, I think it's like 60 now, something like that. You just, Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So you could theoretically, I mean, eventually I feel like they catch on and they stop giving you, <laughs> they stop giving me all these credit card offers. But one day I got this offer. It's like, you have a brand new $20,000 credit card you've been approved for. I didn't even have it. So I go obviously take it. And then immediately in that same appointment at the bank, I'm like, now I want you to take 15,000 of that limit and put it on the line of credit. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's super useful. I like having that because it's just like, hey, if something ever came up, I like having those contingencies. Mm -hmm. For instance, I had a Florida house that was supposed to sell on Friday and this and the buyers backed out Uh, last minute. They gave up their deposit and everything. So um, now I got to relist. So Mm -hmm. when those unexpected things come up, you know, you're thinking you're going to get, you know, $600,000 $600,000 in your account, all of a sudden it's not there. So yeah. <laughs> you got to have, this is the business I play in, right? Not, it's to some people that's absurd. And, uh, but to others, that's, you know, small potatoes. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it's also even just good big business practice because a lot of things which are teaching mm-hmm. investors right now is mm-hmm. actually a lot of people would run like in 100% debt, you mm-hmm. know, and, and then that's, I think, a lot what happened last year too was really getting screwed yeah. over with it. Because, for example, like that with the flip that I was talking mm-hmm. about that I, we did last year and it went really well. Yeah. Um, there was a point in time where we felt that we actually got rid of some of the debts and we paid them out in cash because we were just wondering, you know, what mm-hmm. may happen or preparing and things like that. And I think a lot of people don't have like contingency money, like no, especially when yeah. you're doing like, let's say, flips or yeah. uh, or anything like renovation related, like. People, for some reason, go with like the exact amount, like I need 50K, that's all I want, you know, and they don't think you probably should have extra for all these different things that can Mm -hmm. happen. And then, for example, like because I do private lending, a lot of the things I'm seeing right now in private lending are people asking for money because they're trying to finish up projects. And to me, I mean, that's not these Mm -hmm. kind of deals I will never go for unless if it looks super, super amazing. But that shows to me there was no planning, like the planning wasn't mm-hmm. done properly for the deal because it's just, how are you asking in the middle of your project or at the end of the project, you need more renovation money? You know, mm-hmm. to me, it's just like, why wasn't there buffer room for this? Yeah. You know, and I'm seeing a lot of that actually coming across right now is people needing money to finish up their projects to put them on the market. And what what are they doing wrong? They're, are they not are they not properly estimating their costs? Are they too green that they don't know what's involved and they just they just jumped before they knew? Both. I think it's both. What uh, One that I saw, it was, to be honest, I couldn't tell very much of, like, they gave me the quote and 
and they just said that they had ad- had added extra cost but i feel like also when they're trying to sell something to you they won't really mm-hmm. tell you the truth you know i mean they're going to kind of try to hide and make mm-hmm. things seem better so i found it very hard but it seemed like they didn't i think what happened was they did the you know you go and look at a renovation and you don't put in contingencies for what happens behind the walls that kind of things <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. and i think that's so that would be yes but in that case i think that was their issue and that's i feel like that's either they may have experience in like cosmetic flips and never gone mm. as big or maybe they are just completely new at it but it was one of them it looked like that kind of a thing that it was just the reno got bigger than it really was okay and um so they ended up doing more than they were thinking they were going to do yeah a lot of these things happen to newer investors or people doing their their earlier ones right yeah and you know for them it, they probably should have had a mentor or something they were someone they were working with mm-hmm. or maybe it's just one of the hurdles they'll overcome right or delays actually a lot of them mm-hmm. is delays now that i just remembered delays yeah. in delays things are the worst. Yeah, things, but then they're on private, and then now See, that's the they're problem. eating. Yeah, like what's up your do- what's your daily funds? amount? Yeah, like that's the thing about this Florida one that sucks is like the cost to carry uh, because I have other loans that I'm not paying out, and it's like 140 bucks a day. Mm-hmm. It sucks. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and if you're not prepared for that, because yeah. I, I th- actually I think the biggest mistake, especially with new investors, is I'm gonna get it done in three in let's say three months. Yeah, and, and always then you're assume just, double. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then, you know, on a private that can be very, very hard to deal with. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing, like calculate, especially early on, calculate your your per diem amount. What does it cost to carry that property per day? Mm-hmm. And uh, conduct yourself accordingly, hire mm-hmm. trades accordingly. Uh, right into trades contracts if you're going to go that far Mm -hmm. that if they don't show up or if they cause delays you know there's there's a dollar value associated with with those delays and or permits permits are are one of those ones where yeah you could waste three months trying to get permits and what does that cost you right build that into your your profitability uh and if you can't don't do the deal or find somebody willing to come in with equity with you Mm -hmm. and and you know that way you don't have that yeah uh, that burden so but that, even then something because we're going through it right now that I find very interesting because um, it's our first time dealing with permits in Brampton is that we're getting delays from Brampton is because they have all these different inspectors for everything. Mm-hmm. Like we've had other places where you just have one inspector, one inspector and they're always inspecting everything where these ones are so many different. Well, inspectors. they should have at least a separate building and plumbing inspector. Usually those are separate. Maybe, maybe the plumbing was because we did yeah. get plumbing or or if it's a mechanical but in the other one we didn't have to deal with mechanical so so there's a separate mechanical inspector as well i'm not sure if it but yeah. if for, so for brampton because the other one we i think we only had one maybe two because there was a plumbing mm-hmm. but i can't remember i think it was the same inspector to be honest but i can't sometimes really it is the same yeah like i know london it was two different ones yeah but then brampton they have like six different ones and we're just doing and adding a unit (laughs) and for some reason they decided that they need to have someone inspecting the furnace Mm -hmm. um the plumbing and then the unit itself i don't know there was like five i don't know what the other one's for and well they might have just had like somebody was was like sick that day so they had somebody filling in that's possible too maybe i'm not sure but what what the delay is it's because now they have all these different inspectors Mm -hmm. it's like no one knows the the process and so we're getting different information from different people on how to just get this to flow properly to the point Mm. that actually my husband went today we had to just go into the city go to the city and talk to them because um it was just like no one knew Mm. what was like going on we're just like we just need the first step to just get you know look at the place tell us Mm -hmm. what you want changed and what you want done right and i don't know why that became like the biggest issue in the world and it's i think it's like i don't know if brampton's like over like has way too many projects going on or or that but it's like it's like they're not organized (laughs) so are you telling people not to do permitted flips in brantford or brampton (laughs) sorry (laughs) i'm just saying be prepared for the amount of time it's going to take because it could um, take a while yeah uh because it's just i feel like it's very disorganized and i don't know if it's growth spurts because i've heard that lot to Mm. last year and the year before i know they've been having growth spurt issues well every municipality is going to be struggling because the amount of people coming into those municipalities Mm -hmm. um you know doing doing what they do i think uh 
you know, we could go on days and days of rant about the way the system is in general. And if it's your private residence, but you need a public permit, how does that equate? It's just, <laughs> it's just very odd. It's it, even in the States, you know, it's, it's, they say it's your private residence, but you can find every last detail about somebody's house. Like you can do an online search and find out, you know, what mortgage structure they have first mm -hmm. and a second. Who's the lender? What's their mailing address? It's also <laughs> public. Is it really your private residence? <laughs> It's so true. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's weird, but I digress. Um, so, Diana, what's your portfolio look like right now? What are you invested in? Right now, uh, I mean, last two years we did a lot of flips just because how the, or the, I should, last year we did a flip, but the two years before that we did a lot of flips just because the market was just it was better. Booming. So, just little like, cosmetic flips? No, no, no. We did a full we did, invasive. We did it all over the place. Like, yeah. one, we did a full luxury, gutted, outside and inside in, like everything needs in to be what done. areas that one was in toronto okay so, so it's all one, golden horseshoe mostly or e, for the flips yes okay yeah and then any keepers that you're doing and then well? we had yeah we but that i think it's been now like that probably three years that we've been then done burrs we did a lot we did burrs before and those so you haven't done burrs in three years i don't think yeah i don't think we've done I don't and you think just didn't want burst. to acquire more? Or you no, just... it was just, you know, the deals were so amazing for flipping. Like, we were just finding these... But if it like, deals amazing for flipping, isn't it good for a bird, too? No. Please explain. <laughs> <laughs> I, the cash flow. So, again, for me, oh, running so, a so business... So, not enough cash flow. Yeah, because for yeah. me, so, especially at that time, and I mean, I would like to keep the same um, terms, but, for example, we were always getting 100% of our money back and we were cash flowing. Right? Oh, okay, okay. So I, I'm with you now. Okay. Yeah. So so you're just saying so if you can't get a hundred percent back, then yeah. uh, and the cash flow, very valid point. Like yeah. if you can't make a cash flow, no, no dice. Right. Um, so that's what it was, because yeah. we would want to yeah. refinance to pull out the money. Yeah. And then on the refinance, we want to make sure it's cash flowing. For yeah. example, that's something so people don't think about. So how many 100% percent burrs have you done? Like a lot? Like Not a lot. More a than lot. five? We've done about five, yeah, five, okay. six. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Like not a lot of people can say that where they've, they've done those perfect burrs. I guess in the last few years, if you were doing something, even if you did it horribly wrong, you still did a perfect burr <laughs> because everything went up in value so much. So yeah, that's true. It's been kind to people um, mm -hmm. these last few years it was, in a way yeah. until it you was. hit this last year. Good and bad, I guess. Yeah. Right. Because it's kind to you. I feel like if you don't feel it gives the false burn, confidence, yeah, false if you don't feel the burn, yeah. then yeah. you're that's why you're feeling everything last year and this year now yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah. If you've never been burned before this last year, probably burned you hard yeah uh, unless you were you know listening to podcasts like this and heard me rant about you know don't do it don't do it all the things i did that were stupid <laughs> way back when yeah like if you can internalize somebody else's mistake then you don't need to make it yourself mm -hmm. but it's all about being able to internalize it not just hear it but actually feel the pain of that mistake mm -hmm. and that's like whoa i'm never doing that yeah if you can do that you can save yourself from having to make the mistake yeah and you need it to be honest i feel like the best yeah. learning experiences are the ones that you feel mistakes and mentors um they say <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. i just made the mistakes i mean no i shouldn't say that like i've made a couple of, of blunders early on that hurt real bad and um i've done i've done reasonably well since mm -hmm. um and it depends it i guess where the mistakes happen, happen right because yeah. for example for us we've been very lucky in our real estate we've never made a mistake but you know where our mistakes happened in the renovation business. Mm -hmm. We made lots of mistakes in the renovation you businesses. Buffer? Hmm? You had buffer? It was just, the, the mistakes were things like, for example, you gave a quote, right? And you get the work done. And I remember the very first project my husband did, I think he paid himself like a dollar 16 an Okay, hour. so he was, yeah, quoting out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So renovating for other people. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Renovating yeah. for other people. I'm talking about when we started yeah. the renovation business yeah. and we were, you know, that back then it was yeah. all about clients. So our learning experience. Yeah. So it's funny because people are like, you never had any mistakes happen. I was like, well, we it's learned in ours yeah. in the business, yeah. right? Because we did like a lot of things like that, like learning how to price projects. Yeah. Like we did that and we lost the money, you would say, is, is with the clients, right? It's you don't price it properly. And then, for example, like that, the worst one was ever he paid himself like a dollar six. It was like, <laughs> and you know what? Like that's that in some form, I think has happened to a lot of entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's something you you learn from. I'm mm -hmm. sure your husband and, and you have learned a lot from that. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you learn like that. So it's I feel like in anything you do, you're gonna be 
making your there'll be failures that you have to yeah. learn from and it just depends on where it happens like that mm-hmm. for us so far we've been pretty lucky with the mm-hmm. real estate side we've haven't had to deal but we dealt with it in the business mm-hmm. trying to like learn how to create that business yeah. get it up and running and yeah price the projects properly you yeah. know so i'm guessing your renovations like do you have every last line on, line item accounted for like you know what you're spending on every category before you start the project yeah and how much we, how much are you off like what, what do you allow yourself to be off so actually that's a good question because we have been off even in our flips but we had enough money because for example i think it was in 2021 mm-hmm. where the price of lumber went up and materials yeah. what was it 2020 2020 or 2021 i think it was 20, 2021 2022 where it was we were we were it started in 21 and it yeah. carried through right into 22 mid mid-year it was still like going up and then it started coming back down so yeah so 2021 that was our luxury flip yeah. and but to tell you that was the price increases especially a luxury flip right that's like almost it was mm. a eight six to eight months i can't remember exactly renovation project Mm -hmm. within those eight months our reno project went from three hundred and fifty thousand to to, uh 450 so we actually 100 grand more so 100 grand driven by lumber by by uh, just everything but lumber was the biggest expense but everything was rising but the lumber one was just like the craziest one to deal with because we Mm. were building out rooms we yeah. were doing extensions like it was a massive project that we were yeah. doing um so so i mean even in the changing markets these kind of things are also problems right because um like that you don't expect things to increase so much or so many mm-hmm. things increase in value right because like that from when yeah. we started like we had for example we had um so because it was in toronto we didn't have all our regular suppliers because a lot of people don't like to work in Toronto because we more work in the suburbs. So we had to find, for example, a landscaping guy that worked yeah. in Toronto. And the price he gave us, and we got all our quotes at the beginning. Yeah. And the price he gave us, I think the reason why he didn't come back, I think he felt bad because he the amount- He didn't want to change his price, but it wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah. And But imagine being told that yeah. like a month to closing. And at that time, it would take three months just to find someone and book someone for landscaping. So we had to like pull strings with our guys and beg them to come to Toronto just to finish it off because we're like, we have to get ready for this market um, because we need to get in in it like immediately. So it was all like that. We had there was a lot of changes and there was like about a hundred grand of extra costs of everything yeah. it was insane <laughs> oh man yeah sorry i blame it on my son's right <laughs> um and i think that like I, I mean i know what it's like to have things go beyond what you think they should be um you know my my first one obviously went beyond and then i got a pretty good gauge for where things should be i was like kind of right in line for a while there um it was generally pretty you know i knew the type of reno i did and it was like 200 grand will cover it mm-hmm. and I, and i knew and i didn't need to get super micro i knew there was margin there mm-hmm. uh, but the tighter you are the more you need to break down and mm-hmm. and i knew a guy one of my contractors actually he would he would get everything down to a t and he said to me he's like andrew i just i don't get it he's like it's so frustrating every reno i do i'm always over by exactly two thousand oh. dollars or like roughly like you know yeah, within yeah, a few yeah. bucks and i'm like why he's like it's different every time i'm like did you ever think about throwing a two thousand uh, dollar contingency into your budget he's like oh yeah <laughs> 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 he was doing pretty good though I mean, he uh that's funny he, he knew his stuff like he knew what it would cost him but the challenge for him was he was doing a lot of the work himself mm-hmm. which i think is uh can be fun can be good but also can really really slow you down and uh mm-hmm. slow progress uh, but yeah, key thing is know your numbers. Uh, don't do reckless things. Like we've anyone who's been doing this long enough has been burned and, and, even and has prepared. made miss miss you know bad estimates and all that stuff. Yeah. And, but I was to say even being prepared like that times are changing, yeah. and I think materials and things are still going to be going up in the oh, yeah. future. And and I think and I've been even noticing that actually in the labor market for like the renovations and things. There's a yeah. lot of people now that won't even charge material costs. They're like, here's my labor costs and you take they're like the you take care of the materials and that's because cool. uh, because it's just like we're in a stage because of, they like, don't want they don't want um, of... they don't want you to think yeah it's all them right yeah exactly. and i've had contractors do that too like hey my, my materials 
went up, I'm just going to do a line item that's that shows the increase. Especially yeah. that reno- specifically like finding uh, co- um, companies like renovation companies that just work investors or know the investor world mm-hmm. is very different, right? Because if you say that to a client that, oh, like materials yeah. have gone up or this, like they may not believe you, right? And that's why you have like people, for example, running off on you, like I was telling mm-hmm. you the landscaping people that they were probably like, yeah, they're, they're yeah. going to probably get it. You know, they're thinking they're, she's going to probably get pissed at us because yeah, it's probably yeah, going to yeah. double in price, da, 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 da. And they're like, we just rather leave the situation. Yeah. Whereas at least we're in it and we're seeing it and yeah. we knew that it was happening we would have been like if the yeah guy you should have called him up us, you should, like oh he you just said hey i know i know things have gone up just yeah. have a conversation with me yeah you know, stuff like that um but i i get that yeah if you're not if they're not going to communicate what can you do yeah um yeah that's uh really good conversation that we've had just about you know kind of renos and contingency planning mm-hmm. um i do want to throw this down about what i think about ontario back in 2019 on this podcast you will probably if you listen to all those episodes you would have heard me say multiple times that i think ontario's headed to a renter class like mm-hmm. you're going to have your renter class and your owner class mm-hmm. and i don't know how soon it's going to happen but i was saying that back before all this lockdown nonsense and crazy spending and 500 million dollar 500 billion 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 dollar deficits um and but before all that i thought that now like you see it Mm -hmm. we have we're flooding in over a half a million people into the country in a year and but we we don't have enough housing we're we're not doing enough new housing starts to even accommodate the ones coming in let alone the need for the ones that are already here Uh, so with all that in mind i mean those ingredients spell one thing for the future not to say other things couldn't happen but it looks like if you can own property in Ontario that can cash flow now, you're probably in pretty good good shape for the long run. Mm-hmm. Short run is something we all have to weather. You know, mm-hmm. things are up, they're down as they go up. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's hard to look at the the key indicators and and say that it's not on its way up. The downside of that is the less people that can own a home and afford to start a family, the more left leaning your society becomes, which means the more. Uh, unfriendly to landlords it becomes yeah if you want to make society more right-leaning you know uh hard-working values all that stuff you have to make it easier for people to start a family and, and get a home and uh so this is that dilemma that i see for ontario and i don't know if you would agree or disagree no i completely uh, agree with you <laughs> the dilemma in ontario is as a landlord i see an incredible opportunity but i also see a great reason to get out Mm-hmm. And uh, so I've been conducting myself accordingly. Uh, I do have many hospitals or many. I do have a growing hospitality business here in Ontario. And I think there's great opportunities here in Ontario. But I'm also growing in the States for that reason, as we mm-hmm. talked about off camera before we got in. Mm-hmm. So sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> you feel free to chime in on what you think. I know you said you agree. Yeah, no, no, I definitely I definitely agree with all your points. And actually, I wanted to get your opinion on something because I feel like for example, like I was telling you, I felt very certain about the last two years of how things were going to go. I can't say that I expected, like you are saying, that the interests were going to go up as much as they did, but I was mm. expecting them to go up. I expected maybe a little, yeah. but not a lot. But for yeah. example, like right now, where you're yeah. saying, oh, sorry, you're you're saying that um, la- last year, two years ago, you're kind of confused or not expecting, I guess, what to happen or as much as it did. Yeah. I feel like that right now, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like unemployment is low. GDP is high, you know, yeah. they're bringing in like 500 to a million people. It's like you got to break like, something. Yeah. And, and like, then they like spending hasn't to... changed yet. Exactly. People are still are still doing the the 2021 thing, mm-hmm. um, even though interest rates are higher. Like no one's really been hurt yet. And I used to say this, too. I, I said it would take an event where people like a hey, lose their pensions or or something real bad happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so as of right now, I haven't seen a break something kind of event in either the US or Canada. Mm-hmm. So I'm with you. It's yeah. it's hard to predict what's going to happen. If that so breaks some, something event doesn't happen, you won't see a true change in behavior. Yeah. 2008 was a huge break something event when all these people lost their homes. Like they literally went homeless. Like they they had uh you know mortgages where they had no documents. Like they they were you know drove real estate values through the roof. Mm-hmm. Their their houses all went underwater. They had non-recourse loans meaning that they could literally just walk away. And they mm-hmm. did. Um, and that destroyed that market and uh, put a lot of people out of their homes. That was a big event. So what would happen here? Like, yeah. and, and will there be one? Or will we just continue to tolerate this inflation? This is the other possibility that inflation just continues. Um, and it's it's slightly less than it was. But I mean, 
uh, it's already we're already in this unaffordable territory right yeah like well, and then, exactly what you were saying yeah. about um for example again the interest rates that yeah. they were like let's say the government wouldn't be willing to do what it needs to take for example like that like i feel like yeah. right now because then I they would like, break something yeah they would break the economy if they went to 20 percent and controlled inflation you'd break the economy and control inflation yeah <laughs> and that's why I've, that's to be honest before I, I felt like that's what we were going to do i'm like yeah. we're probably going to go into a high inflation i was i was concerned for a while there that we were going to 20 percent. i i was also thinking yeah. that but then now i'm yeah. feeling like that now i'm feeling confused because i was like me Maybe they're going to try not to break it, right? And they're just well, going to like... Well, it kind of feels like that's what they're doing now. I mean... <laughs> but with what, But though? in their... What, what are they doing to make that happen? Because I, like, I feel like I'm where you were before, you know, well, saying like they're not willing to... Not that I really the, want the, them the to The calculation do it, but... <laughs> of inflation we have is false to begin with yes. because it allows for substitution. So if you switch from... It assumes that you will switch from, from steak to chicken. You know, that's an example. I'm, uh, that's, that's a hypothetical example. One example. Um, <laughs> rather than stick with steak if steak goes up in, in cost. So because it allows substitution and it and it adjusts the weighting of, of different categories based on if they went up, okay, well, you'll just switch to this. Yes. Um, because they do that, it's not a true inflation. Exactly. So what, what we've seen is the bulk of the inflation all happened. Um, when did it really start? It started sort of, what, early 2021 or mid-2021. It really started to go. Um, like showing? And, and, yeah, Actually mid, showing them? Yeah, them? we started showing bigger numbers in early to mid-2021 20, into 2022. Yeah. And, you know, they started reacting to it in, in early 2022. Mm -hmm. But but because of the bulk had already would, was already a year ago, mm -hmm. now you're year over year starts to look smaller. And that's mm. the territory we're in now. Our year over years look smaller, even though inflation is still high. It's just not as high as it was uh, year over year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean our, our prices went back down to what they were back in 2021. They didn't. Uh, but it starts to give us the illusion that things are OK. So mm -hmm. what could that trigger? That could trigger more inflation now because people get comfortable. They keep spending. As we know, people are still kind of behaving like they did. Yeah, two I years mean, ago GDP hasn't changed that tells you something yeah and unemployment right? or unemployment or still low yeah <laughs> like people are getting jobs i mean everybody out there still wants to hire mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's a tricky time to navigate and you have to be steadily ready for what might happen mm -hmm. and that's easier and it could said go than both done ways <clears throat> like you said yeah. right it could be that matt or i said this one like i was like they just go to 20 percent, get it done and over with but i don't feel like they're ready to i don't think they would ever mm -hmm. do that because they want to, yeah. Or I don't, I don't say. Well, every government because... has to, like you know, has to weigh the fallout from what they do. You know, are they going to get elected again? Are people going to show up with pitchforks in front? You know, <laughs> you know, like they're all, they're weighing these things and mm -hmm. they're you know they're calculated about it. Like how much can we get away with? How yeah. how can we rally support? You know. Exactly. You know, yeah. so, so it's so yeah, that's why I said I didn't think that they <laughs> they had it. They had what it took to to do what it would take mm -hmm. because what it would take would be very mm -hmm. um, so it's funny because what you're saying, I feel like is right now, too. I feel yeah. like that now. I yeah. don't think they're willing to do what it takes. Like they yeah. like you said, they kind of pushed as much as they could. And now I'm like, yeah. will they actually go through it and do it. Maybe, maybe say. not, you know, Tough to say. Yeah. So um, this is why I think it's it's a great idea to to go find affordable markets that cash flow really well now. Yes. Uh, that could sustain uh, values dropping. Mm -hmm. You know, if if your values drop but you still have cash, cash flow, flow doesn't matter. Then you you ride that out. Yeah. You need to be prepared for these things. Hundred uh, percent. So you, there is a way to structure your business to be ready for whatever. Because at the end of the day, we're speculating. We don't mm -hmm. know. We don't know yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, you're playing a game. We're playing this capitalist game. And uh, we we get uh, the benefits and the burdens of it. Hundred percent, completely yeah. agree. And and although I mean now we're going through this, seems like we're getting multi a lot of multiple offers. But it's happening again. Yeah, yeah. which I'm very again. Well, people I'm need people need a place to live. This is the immigration coming in. Like I, I don't think people are happy about it. They're not happy about selling for less than they would have a year ago. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, what else are they going to do? Mm -hmm. Like they they some people just out of necessity needed to return to the market, and I think that's what we're seeing now. Yeah. Um, so on that note, I and mean, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the market general, um, a lot of good lessons here, too. Um, you said you're doing private lending. Tell me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I do. Basically, the strategy I do actively, I also do it passively. So it is for flips and burrs. Like first mortgages, second mortgages or um, promissory notes. Always mortgages. I've okay. never been a promissory note type of person, yeah. <laughs> especially. Yeah, I'm not one of those at all. But um 
But it's funny because, for example, like I was telling you about the trends that I see, one of the things I love about private lending is because I get to do a lot more private lending than I do mm-hmm. active projects just because my husband likes to work on like one project at a time. So we are not working yeah. on like multiple projects. Yeah. So private, lend- private lending gives me the in on you get to see where the trends numbers. are happening. Yeah. Right, because like yeah. that, like what was it? Um, two years ago, all flips, yeah. all huge one-year term type projects, very big projects, very mm-hmm. big flips. Last year, everything went to one to two-year renovate. Sorry, one to two-month renovations. So being out within three to six yeah, months. Really so it was six-month terms, right? Yeah. Now. Uh, which I haven't invested any of my money because I can't find a project that I like. But now it's everyone that doesn't have money because of certain things that happen and mm. they're trying to like finish up the project. So they want quick money to mm. finish off the renos to and get it going. high leverage situations already? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, okay. or not some of them. There was one actually I wanted so badly, but they already had a private lender on and initially they were saying no. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know why, because they had so much equity. Yeah. And like they had one house paid off cash. And I'm like, I'll take that one. Yeah. Put the money on there. Go put your renovation somewhere else. But and I think maybe because I told them, I guess, because I was like, oh, I'll put mine on this one. I'm fine. I'll okay. give you this. And then, and then, then, the, and then I guess the other the other lender probably was like, oh, we'll do that kind of we'll thing, too. Yeah. And obviously for them, it was easier because they didn't have to deal with yeah. like going through the lawyer fees and all this stuff. But I really wanted so, that one because that one was even though they were, mm-hmm. um, they didn't have the money, they had the equity. Yeah. Uh, so I was so there are things that I'm willing to do. But again, it has to be yeah. worth it for me to see something. So you lend RSPs or cash? Cash. Okay, so you're just lending out cash that you have stuff that you guys have generated from your business or savings and or all the yeah. above. Okay. And what are your ideal lending amounts? Um, like that, like for example, like before I would do seconds when the market was good, I was fine to do seconds. So those could range from, I think I did one. No, I didn't. Uh, like a hundred k was the minimum. Usually yeah. between a hundred to five hundred was what I was anywhere in there doing. Yeah. Okay. But now because I'm only interested in firsts, it's obviously like I went from mm-hmm. doing six to ten ten private lens in a year. To I, yeah. I only right now I only have two. Those are like existing from last year. Last mm-hmm. year is when I started doing only firsts, mm-hmm. but I don't see myself being able to do more than like three or four, just yeah. because now it's like bigger lump sum amounts. And yeah. I, right now all my vesting is in Ontario or private yeah. lettings in Ontario. Okay, but so it is. It's it has gone a lot less because obviously now I'm like bringing you know mm-hmm. bigger lump sum amounts to be able to go in a first position because the price of houses here are, are expensive yeah first position is, is obviously you gotta you gotta put up more that's, yeah that's the bigger thing yeah right? um okay yeah. so you can cool. tell i become very conservative <laughs> i'm so like my risk yeah. tolerance is like nowhere like <laughs> I hear you. okay and uh you're working full-time still no, no, full no, time. not an engineer anymore. Or? No, not an engineer anymore. Yeah. yeah. So this is your full time business between being a lender and being involved in your flipping business. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you involved in helping your husband's renovation business as well? No, like what we did at the beginning, I helped him because he's not a business person. So I helped him mm-hmm. like with the back end. Yeah. But now that everything got said, he knows how to run the business mm-hmm. now. I, now it's our, our relationship is very different mm-hmm. in the business sense. I actually like it because so now it's more like I hire him, like he treats me like a client. So mm-hmm. I go find the projects, I find find the deals, and I basically mm-hmm. hire him to do the work. And I actually like that dynamic. And of you working, have one going on honest. right now. Right, right now. Well, we are actually going through our pre, our like we're we've had some turnovers. So right okay. now it's like dealing with turnovers, and also we have like we're adding another unit, but this is to an existing one. So we're just kind of working with okay, our okay. So no portfolio. active builds or anything or renos. No, right now, no. Just turning over some tenants. Yeah, and stuff. turning okay. over tenants and like adding a unit. Still to looking building. for projects, though. I am. Yeah. So you're ready to to go back to flipping. Uh, yeah, but I can tell you, I have like many exit strategies. Like my yeah, last, last, course. last is obviously me. If I have to hold it, I'll hold it. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I so you're like being very flips. discerning about what you'll take. So you're not you're not going to be aggressive in this. You're just going to find a, a good deal. Um, what what are some ways you're finding deals if you're going to find one? It's um, so like that. Like I'm very open to anything. So I go to the wholesalers. I go to MLS. Like I have realtors that are looking out. Are you for looking me. every day? 
Um, no, I don't look every day. <laughs> so you have, you have they, people sending they, you yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah they, okay. they send me good deals. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, and I do even have a guy that I partner with where we send out flyers. Flyers. Okay. So I, so we do, I am open to anything. Cause I know there's some people that are, for example, I only do wholesale deal buys because they're better this and that. But look at two years ago. I don't know if you noticed, but when I was looking two years ago, oh, wholesale deal. deals were more expensive than, yeah, than MLS on the market. Listing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They turned it into its own private market. That was yeah, the fun. yeah, yeah. So for me, that's yeah. why I feel like it's so important to just because again, even in different those kind of different markets, you see how things are yeah. changing, right? And you see where 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 to go and where the good deals are happening. For sure. Okay. Very cool. So Diana, we're uh, we're running long on time here. So tell uh, tell our listeners and uh, viewers where they find you and learn more about you. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and that's on Investor Girl Diana. So you can find me there very easily. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the uh, conversation. It was nice to finally meet you. I know I've done a live stream on your Instagram before a long while back from my car. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's uh, it's good to connect. Um, we didn't even talk about your uh, platform. So if, if there's like a 20 second blurb you want to throw out there about what you're doing, I thought it was pretty cool. 20, 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, I guess a quick liner for that is I'm creating basically, I would say a Facebook but for real estate investors. Yeah. So a, a community, like a safe community for real estate investors, mentors, and real estate professionals to have this community where all the, everyone's a real estate investor or new, like yeah. people looking to learn. And so it's just an, um, uh, an environment for people to be able to come yeah. in, learn and share their knowledge. And who's coding this? Cause it's like, it, that's not a simple task. Did you have like a platform <laughs> you were building off of? Uh, yeah, I was, I'm using WordPress. So it's on WordPress. It's on WordPress. But it's crazy the way it functions. <laughs> like, I didn't know you could do that on WordPress. But yeah, very cool. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting thing that you, that you did. And I said to you briefly is like, I think that you could probably use that to host certain specific content and you just naturally be able to drive people to that mm -hmm. platform. And there's so many investors out there that don't like Facebook. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't well, have to be and on I Facebook. And I think another thing that I forgot to mention is actually mm -hmm. one of the things that I really like about it is that you can have your profiles that are specific to what like what you'd want to share about yeah, a real what estate you're doing, investor. Yeah, what you're looking for. You can actually also share your project yeah. your projects, so your properties, and you can even mm -hmm. share and display your pro projects. And one thing that it, to help people gain their credibility, especially when you're new and you're going in, is, is to be, have them. But also, we're giving the option of verifying yeah. those projects, so you can actually have your project verified, and it's just basically checking that the numbers you're saying they are are true, and then it becomes like a verified project. So then it gives yeah. you another level of cre credibility. To, Interesting. to what you're doing. Wow. If we had more time, we'd dig into that. We'll have to do another uh, recap on that one. <laughs> but uh, thanks, Diana, for uh, for doing this. And uh, I'll look forward to catching up with you again. Yeah. Thanks for, so much for having me on here. Anytime. There are a lot of people out there talking about the infinite banking strategy and whether or not it makes sense for them. To find out what it's all about and if it's a fit for you, visit controlandcompound.com forward slash Andrew Hines, where my audience can gain exclusive access to books, podcasts, and webinars tailor-made for real estate investors.